Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express. I am your host and producer tonight, Preeti Mangla Shekhar, with my co-producer and curator creator of tonight's special edition, Anuj Vaidya. Today's show is going to be a speculative adventure about forests set in the future. It is set in South Asia but relevant everywhere including right here in California. The attack on forests is a universal phenomenon. While the particular stories are different, the end result is the same. We are undoing the very fundamental cycles of life, death and rebirth in our rush to progress. Whether it is the new fire ecology in the Sierras or the shiny new metro in Bombay, it is our love for fossil fuels that has brought us to this critical juncture. On this information-packed adventure, we take you on a visit to the urban forests of Mumbai, India, which are being destroyed in the name of development. There is no doubt that this year and decade has been a scary, sordid, surreal one. From the COVID pandemic, to colonies of locusts attacking entire farms and communities, to cyclones making unprecedented landfall on densely packed cities, it has been a time of global sorrow and doom. A crisis in public health, a mental health crisis, and an economic recession that is already underway, and the sixth extinction even further ahead in its path, there is no dearth of exploding catastrophes that have converged to make this not just an extraordinary moment in history, but a truly scary one. But we want to remind our listeners that this kind of crisis is not new. Why are we talking about deforestation during this deep crisis? It is important that we make the connections between deforestation and disease. One of the reasons for COVID-19's occurrence is large-scale deforestation. With the approaching fire season in California during the pandemic, we are going to face numerous complications and hence the urgency to understand the linkages between our environments and health and how they are much more deeply interconnected than we realize. Turn, therefore, to the voice of the forest in this speculative episode to open new doors of understanding for us. We travel to the future, to 2042, to envision Bombay from the point of view of RA, an urban forest and a biodiversity hotspot in the heart of the mega city, and one that is rapidly fragmenting and disappearing much like forests across India and the world. So, how do we tell the story of a forest? What do they have to say to us? Why do we need to hear this from the forest's point of view? How do we show up for the forest? To think through these questions, we have queer feminist scholar Anuj Vaidya on our show today. Anuj Vaidya is a PhD candidate in performance studies at UC Davis. His work meanders around the themes of queer ecologies and examines how normativity is constructed and policed through the category of the human, who is allowed to access this category, who benefits from it, at whose expense. He is working on a queer sci-fi eco-feminist retelling of the South Asian epic, the Ramayana, as a Sitayana. This episode is based on his academic research that was conducted in the city of Mumbai or Bombay last year as part of his fieldwork. For a longer conversation about the process and concrete action items we can take, please join us for an online conversation via Zoom at the end of this episode from 8 to 9 p.m. You can access the Zoom conversation at tinyurl.com slash forests and floods. We need stories of possibility at this hour, not just to enable us, the living, to live our dreams, but to live it differently. And with that, I welcome Anuj on tonight's show. Welcome, Anuj. Thank you, Preeti. Thank you for having me on the show today. So, Anuj, your research on forests began at home at a very personal place. Uh, Tell us about your academic journey as an artist and researcher 
that wound up in you following this historic arc of human use and abuse of forests? For me, this project started as a performance project um, and as a storytelling project, right? I was, uh, I'm, I'm invested in retelling the Ramayana um, as a Sitaina. And I want to take seriously the idea that Sita, who is the female protagonist of the story, uh, is a daughter of the earth. So in my retelling, Sita doesn't emerge as a human, but she emerges as a forest. And so it's about, it's through the forest voice and through the forest desires that I want to reimagine the story. Right? So Ramayana has been a story that has been repurposed for the political and social purposes of the moment throughout history, right? Over the last 2000 years, it's been retold over again, putting at the center of the narrative, the most important social issues at the moment. And for me, I think it's important now uh, to retell this story as a story about uh, the sixth extinction, about climate collapse, right? Especially because the story has such great political, social, and cultural purchase in South Asia and across South Asia, right? So, and also the, the Ramayana actually um, captures the relationship between um, uh, between the city and the forest, like that story and, and actually all the epics have kind of shaped um, our relationship to forests in South Asia. Um, and they also kind of are a historical document of what happened with forests. I mean, they talk about deforestation on a massive scale in the deep history of South Asia, right? And that's what those epics are capturing is the clearing of forests in the indo gangetic plains and like the settling of those plains. And so, what I wanted to do was find a forest in the present that had that same tension between the city and the forest, right? And the RA forest in Bombay uh, ended up being the perfect place to think about these issues. So basically, RA is an incubator of reimagining our histories as histories of, you know, the violence of development and deforestation that happened historically and how it played out, right? We focus on the stories of how it played out i think that's what i'm hearing absolutely no no absolutely i think i think the idea is to actually trace it through deep time so you'll see in the podcast uh in the speculative story about the year we start with deep time and enter into the present right making a connection between the past and the present not to say necessarily that like there's a causal effect between like what happened before and now because um there's so much we don't know about our histories as well, right? But there's patterns, right? Um, you know, there's patterns of um, of human relations to forests that we can glean from our past stories. And how can we use those stories um, uh, to shed some light on the present as well? Right. And then, like we talked about earlier in, the, um, in our introduction, the story of Are is not a new one deforestation is a universal phenomenon, right? So tell us more about the RA movement and how it actually also parallels scenarios unfolding everywhere, including right here in California in many ways. You know, forests across the world are like disappearing at an alarming rate, right? I think we're losing a forest the size, forests cover the size of the UK every year, uh, which is enormous. And last summer while I was researching like fragmentation of urban forests, no forests around the world were burning. There were wildfires in the Amazon and the Australian bush, in the Boreal Forest of Canada, in the Republic of Congo, and right here in California. What is happening in terms of climate change and in terms of forests might look very different uh, in India, because in India it's not fires but floods that are that are coming, right? Or I mean, I'm, I'm gonna say in Bombay, uh, not in India, because fires are an issue all over the world. Uh, but in Bombay, it's not fires, but floods that are really uh, uh, the big problem. Whereas in California, it's fires that are the big problem, right? And the drought, uh, which are also killing trees. But what connects the two is the colonial practices of managing forests, uh, where we turn forests into plantations, right? Uh, or timber to be extracted, or where we saw forests basically as resources to be extracted, right? Uh, as opposed to forests having value in and of themselves. Because forests actually are so important for the health of the planet, for human health. They help build the water table, so without the forest cover, a lot of rainwater is lost with runoff, 
which also leads to soil erosion. They're important for nutrient cycling, nutrient cycling in our ecosystems, air and water purification. They're extremely important carbon sinks. Uh, urban forests have been known to increase healthy microbiomes in people. They reduce the temperature in cities and therefore also our energy use because we then use less air conditioning. They reduce noise pollution, air pollution in cities like Bombay. Uh, but with the loss of forests, um, our, our ability to counter climate collapse and environmental pollution is also decreasing, right? And in California, you're seeing a different kind of kind of pollution because of forests. Um, you know, um, from the forest fires uh, that happen, uh, an in staggering amount of carbon is released into the atmosphere, right? Wildfires in California in 2018 released roughly about 68 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and air quality is a huge issue in Bombay. And in Bombay, it's the opposite, right? It's the fact, like the RA forest is called the green lung of the city because it's one of the last remaining like uh, old growth forests within the city. And it's very important for air purification. But as um, the city continues to destroy its forests, the air quality of the city is going down as well. And so you see these weird resonances between Bombay and California. But they take place in their very particularly different ways um, in each of these places. So Anuj, basically this story of uh, what is development is actually a very violent one. And this segment that we are now going to listen to um, is, is based on the RA campaign, but is also set in the future. What do you want listeners who join us on this futuristic journey to understand um, about about RA? So yes, absolutely. So um, so the podcast you're about to listen to is about a 40-minute podcast, and it is um, the story of the RA forest from the year 2042. Right? So when uh, so last year when I was in RA, I I met um, I met a community of activists. And I met uh, leaders from the Varli community, who are the indigenous folks who live in within the urban forests of Bombay, right? And these folks, for the last five years, since 2014, uh, they have been waging a battle against the city of Bombay. Uh, and the city has been trying to take over and deforest and cut down trees in the RA forest in order to, for, for a whole bunch of different infrastructure projects, right? Um, uh, to build a metro, there is a slum rehabilitation authority, an SRA uh, that is in the works. There is um, a zoo, a biodiversity park that is being proposed. So they want to cut down the forest and build a zoo uh, in its place. And so the forest, however, um, is home to about uh, 10,000 indigenous community members, right? The Varli people actually live inside this urban forest. Uh, it's also a biodiversity hotspot. Um, uh, there's about 50 leopards, wild leopards that actually live within city limits inside this forest. There are endemic species of spiders that are only found in this nook of the forest. Uh, there's over 250 varieties of birds. Um, you know, also the Mithi River originates within the RA forest. Um, and the forest is also the floodplains of the river. So there's a, it's an ecologically sensitive zone, right? Um, that is also inhabited by indigenous peoples uh, and by wildlife. And so the environmentalists and the indigenous communities have been battling the city saying, development cannot be at the expense of the forest and the forest peoples and the forest inhabitants. Right? Why is it that it's always a forest that is torn down for these infrastructure pro projects? Why don't we think of tearing down a mall to put in a metro station in its place, right? Um, especially when the forest is doing the work of like actually resisting um, or helping us actually uh, modulate climate change, right? So, and climate change, is, and when I was there last year, uh, working with these activists and these indigenous leaders, protesting against the city, um, a lot of conversations about climate change came up. And right at the heart of this work, um, the UN put out a report basically saying that all the projections they had of ice melt 
and rising sea levels in coastal cities was actually um, was they they projected much less than the actual uh, damage was going to be, and so they put out these new projections with maps from 2050, from the year 2050, and what they thought cities would look like, right? And the map of Bombay was kind of shocking because um, all that was left of Bombay was the forest, was the Ari Forest and the Sanjay Gandhi National Park in the center. And the rest of the city seemed like it would be underwater. So for me, um, this moment, right, the Sevari movement became kind of a seed of a possibility of one direction that we could follow, a story of resistance that we could follow, or we could follow the story of development, right? The story of development would lead us to the dystopic vision that you're about to hear in this, in this speculative story. And the story of resistance would lead us maybe to a different path. And I want us to think what would happen if actually we, start, we follow the story of resistance, right? How might the vision be different? If we don't want the vision that is in um, this story you're about to hear to come true, then maybe we need to be following the stories of resistances, which exist in the present and they exist in the past. How do we actually um, activate ourselves towards those stories as a community, as a city, right? So in Bombay, it was like a, like in the in the RA movement, the number of people involved in the movement were actually very few, but they captured the imagination of the city and actually of the whole nation. Like the RA movement was a conversation that was a national public conversation. It was the first time that the residents of Bombay actually realized that there were indigenous peoples living inside the forest, right? Uh, they had no idea that, that this urban center, this mega city, um, actually had Wadley tribal members who had been living, farming, and making a life inside the forest. Um, this moment also made it possible for indigenous activists and, environment act and environmental activists to come together and work uh, together while centering indigenous rights. Um, and it was also a youth-led movement, right? Um, there were a lot of young people, both from the indigenous communities as well as from the surrounding, um, um, from the citizens of Bombay, uh, who got involved um, uh, in this movement. But what if more people had actually stood up for the forest? What if more people had stood up against the city and said, no, actually we need to protect the forest, even if it means not having a metro. There are other solutions, right? So that's what I want us to think about, uh, the possibilities of resistance and where those might lead us to. So before we jump into the into the segment, uh, I would just like to thank a few people, uh, Ishani Saraf, uh, William Stafford, who are the voice of the forest uh, in this piece, uh, Bettina Ingueno, who is the voice of the leopard, and Kevin Dockery, who provided the uh, soundscape in the piece. I would also like to thank the amazingly generous and inspiring Wadli peoples of the Ari forests of Bombay and uh, the amazing activists that I met during my time there. Uh, this work would not have been possible without them uh, and their uh, inspiring activism. So without further ado, here is a forest and blood. The Great Flood arrived in August 2042. These were floods that defiantly returned the city to a prior ecology, to a clutch of islands in the Arabian Sea, which is how Bombay began its ascent towards the megalopolis it has now become. While the city was originally built upon seven islands, the number of islands that have resulted from these most recent floods is still unknown. The disaster is ongoing. There will be other floods. We are sure of it. They are annual occurrences now during the monsoon season. The pitfalls of living below the high tide line in a city where the government is always three steps behind. Unless you are of the right class or caste or religion. We call these fragments of land reclaimed by the sea islands. 
but we are not sure they would agree with that designation. These are not self-contained pieces of land, you see. They have histories and embodiments that extend beyond their edges and they know they are only a fragment of what they once were. We are very familiar with fragments. As an urban forest in one of the fastest growing urban conglomerations, we know what that means intimately. We have have lost lost much of ourselves ourselves to the insatiable needs of this frothing city over time, to the the flood flood of humans who have consumed entire groves, valleys, hills and lakes, and all their biological exuberance. Less than 200 years ago, we were part of an extended range of forests running all the way up to the western coast of India, to the Ran of Kutch and Gujarat. Now we are battling to hold on to what is left of us. We are besieged by the city of Bombay, when the seven islands that lay south of us were amassed into a single city by 1845. We were still far from its borders, on the neighboring island of Salsend. Now we are at the heart of this megalopolis, which grows hungrier and hungrier each day, eating away at our edges and our centers, turning green forest into cement jungle in the blink of an eye in the blink of an eye. Your history history remembers us as far back as as the 4th century century BCE when when humans humans had to pass through our dense cover in order to reach the ports at Kalyan and Sopara. But we remember a time before humans even existed when the greater Indian plate cleaved off from Madagascar in the Indian Ocean, the landmass you call the Deccan Plateau, of which I am a part, was formed close to 68 million years ago. For four million years, lava from the Indian Ocean floor erupted, pushing greater India towards Eurasia and giving birth to the basalt foundations that we are now housed on. All the forests on the great Indian plain were reduced to a sliver in the searing cataclysm. It would take the collision for the Eurasia and the formation of the Himalayas to cool the earth enough to allow a proliferation of trees and grasses and the return of forests on this plateau. While birds and reptiles had ruled the world before, in this new world order, it was mammals who ruled the roost. They came to us from over the Himalayas or hopping over a series of islands from Southeast Asia. And so began the journey towards today, 55 million years in the making from one cataclysm to another. You did not see this coming, coming, but we we did. 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 Commerce and And shipbuilding shipbuilding ultimately undid the forests of Bombay, Bombay. given its thriving textile industry and and the steady steady influx of labor from from the the hinterlands. This this meant meant that that more forests forests had to be cleared cleared to make way for human progress, and and it it all happened in the blink of an eye. We remember when Bhimdev, the Hindu king of Gujarat, came to these shores in the 1300s with a retinue of settlers. The The island forests here were still blanketed blanketed by babu trees trees and banyans, tamarind and bear, ak and plantain, and with mangroves where the forests met the sea. The mangroves are all gone now, either cut down or destroyed, trying to hold back the momentum of the rising sea. They might have succeeded if they had not been reduced to tatters. If we go further back in time, a thousand years before that. At the turn of the first millennium, the forests of the South Set were populated by Buddhist monks who hewed monasteries out of the basalt hills that lay within our expanse. 
they did, they did this all the way, way through, through to the 10th, to the 10th century, century CE. C. The Christian missionaries had also made it here as early as 55 BC and, and managed, managed to, to convert, convert members of the Koli tribe to Christianity. Christianity. These were the earliest inhabitants of the island, primarily fisherfolk who had lived along the coastal areas and depended on fishing for their survival. Then came the Gujarat Sultanate in the 1400s and the Portuguese in the 1500s and already the vision of a future port nestled within its islands had begun to take hold of the imagination. In 1753, this vision started to become a reality when the British East India Company began construction of the naval dockyards. A little over a century later, in 1870, the Bombay Port Trust was inaugurated bringing all of Bombay's dockyards under one unified command. By this time, the seven islands had also been reclaimed and consolidated as one city and the Bombay Municipal Corporation was born in 1782. There was a time not long ago when we were just forest, not urban forest, not defined by our relation to the settlement. It was the city, the human realm, that was the fragment then. In those days, we did not know where we began and where we ended. What did it matter what size we were? It was not acreage that was our primary concern. Rather, it was the richness of our relations, the depth of feeling that passed between the distributed selves that animated us, binding the mycelial undercommons, the understory, the canopy, the many microbes, fungi, insects, birds and animals, including humans, into me. Do not forget that a forest is not just the trees. In the meantime, the four shrinks a little every day, surrounded on all sides by dense networks of roads that have been the foremost technology for their fragmentation. Did you know that there is an 18% higher chance of deforestation when there's a road next to a forest? All that is left of this forest now is a series of green patches on South Set. Not so long ago, Sussex was home to a dense forest on the outskirts of the city, teeming with life big and small. From leopards like me that roam the forest tracks all the way up the northern coast, to trapdoor spiders that were only found in this particular nook of the forest. But by the turn of the 21st century, this once remote island was the center of Bombay's urban sprawl, and this forest, called Sante Gandhi National Park. This is a recent name. The forest has had many other similar parks, gained the dubious distinction of being declared an urban forest, which, by all accounts, seems to be a forest that is destined to shrink and disappear. Just 30 years ago, there were still 50 of us leopards that called this forest home. We lived side by side with the Wali tribe who lived and farmed in the forest, sharing the forest scape and coexisting mostly peacefully on the 30,000 acres of forest that still remained. This included the protected forest of the Sanche Gandhi National Park and the not so protected forest that surrounded it. What the folk? of Bombay called the Ari Forest. You see, the thing with names is that it allows humans to take two contiguous tracts of forest land and turn them into two completely different forests, as if they had no relation whatsoever with one another. But for all intents and purposes, 
All right, it's just an extension of the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. Us lepers, we did not make a distinction between the two forest parcels, moving freely between their borders to hunt and raise our cubs. But for the forest department, the different names meant one could assign different levels of protection. The Hare Forest was merely a buffer zone for the protected Sanjay Gandhi National Park. It was there so that the park did not have to suffer the consequences of urbanization. Are would bear the burden for being on the front lines. When the city was burgeoning, but not quite choking yet, this was a non-issue. For instance, in the 1950s, Are was the site of a massive cooperative dairy farming experiment which provided milk for the entire Bombay region. But the forest department allowed the Walis and the Kulis and other traditional forest dwellers to continue to live and farm in the forest. Charging them a symbolic rent of one rupee per gunther for the privilege. Little did they know that a trap was being set for humans and for leopards. By the 1980s, the dairy industry was not lucrative enough. Milk could be imported from further away, but land was in short supply here. So the government started to dream up non-bovine projects for Are. All of a sudden, our ancestral territory was crisscrossed by all kinds of human activity. Bombay's entertainment industry got a chunk of land to build film city, an outdoor studio that would provide a realistic forest backdrop for film production, tribal villages and all. The police got a chunk of land to run exercises for Force One, its elite anti-terror squad, running right through a 200-year-old Wali settlement. The Bombay Veterinary School acquired a handsome acreage to establish its campus and an illegal apartment complex and luxury hotel, the Royal Palms, cropped up in the middle of the forest, trailing a shantytown in its wake where the help lived. But nobody seemed to notice, or rather no one seemed to care, except when we prowled into their field of vision. To be honest, these encounters with leopards were few and far between. We were not prone to attacking humans. We go for smaller prey, such as pigs and dogs, which in turn are attracted to human settlements, whether as scavengers or as pets. For the food they provide, the tribal communities knew this implicitly. They worshipped us in the form of the deity Vahoba, and we lived alongside them for millennia. They made sure to keep their villages free of garbage, which attract pigs, and they used their dogs as an alarm call to alert them to our presence. They made sure their children were never left unattended, for we can and do easily mistake children for a piglet, and adults made sure never to squat low in the dark, which might inspire us to attack thinking the prey was a small animal. But the new arrivals in the forest, whether in high rises or in shanty towns, were ignorant of these arrangements with us. The former had grown up in urban centers, and the latter were migrant workers coming from rural areas who had encroached on the forest because there was no place for them in the city. The city administrators responded with their typical cunning, using the excuse of leopards and encroachment 
to erase the difference between traditional forest dwellers and migrant laborers, demanding the emptying of humans from the forest, and eventually the emptying of it leopards as well. A biodiversity park within the forest was proposed by some uninspired bureaucrat, and this was immediately lauded as a great philanthropic gesture towards the animal citizens of the city. In the park, we would be protected so that our gene pools would not disappear. Suffice to say, there are no wild leopards left in Bombay anymore, and our gene pools have been reduced to the two mating pairs left who are now forced to breed in captivity. I am one of those cage survivors. Unlike us leopards, who had no possibility of resistance, when the indigenous communities were evicted from the forest, they resisted for a while and invoked their prior rights to the land which were guaranteed to them through the Forest Rights Act of 2006. We had no such rights. But even this was a short-lived resistance, for when the Walis and the Kolis were asked to prove their claims to the land by providing archival evidence of ownership, they realized that so many of them had not bothered to keep copies of contracts made with the state. They had never thought of the land in terms of ownership. Rather, it was their relationship to Hirva and Valhova that bound them to this land. The forest was Hirva, the goddess herself, and she pervaded the water, the soil, and the air. If anything, Hirva and Valhova owned the forest. How could a piece of paper contain the richness of relation they knew to be possible here? For they knew that the forest was not just the trees. Then in 2014, something unexpected happened. A small group of eco-conscious nature enthusiasts raised a voice on behalf of the forest. It was the first time I recall such a thing happening in this city. And thankfully, it was not the last time. The movement was called Hashtag Save RA, and it surprised even the activists themselves who had regarded Bombay's citizens as largely apathetic. It was a sign on a tree notifying citizens about a scheduled tree cutting that lit the spark. It turned out that there were 25 more hundred trees in line to be chopped behind that one to make way for a car shed for Bombay's shiny new metro. But that was too high a price to pay for those who frequented this sliver of the forest. Have you ever ventured into RA? As a journalist for a local newspaper, I followed this movement closely and had a chance to get to know the sliver of the forest quite well. And I must say that anyone who ventured into that lush expanse was in for quite a pleasant shock. And even the fragments that still remain today have not lost all their magic. All of a sudden, the sounds and smells of traffic would disappear. There would be birdsong in the breeze. The air would cool down a few degrees, and one would be tempted to laze away the entire day chasing butterflies and buffaloes. What a gift for anyone who lived in one of the noisiest cities of the world. And for those who dared stay into the night, the insect crescendo 
was bewildering and beautiful. And you might even have encountered a leopard within city limits. What a thrill! The problem was that hardly anyone ventured out to the forest in this sprawling city, for getting to the forest was quite a challenge. A metro might have resolved this very problem in a traffic-clogged city, but the conundrum was that the metro and all the other development projects the city had imagined would replace the forest, and then you wouldn't need to make the trip after all. So rather than choose between the metro and the forest, the activists tried to have their cake and eat it too. They wanted the car shed moved to a different location altogether. Now there were a host of very good reasons to relocate the car shed site, not least of all being the fact that the chemical waste from the shed would spill directly into the Mithi River, asphyxiating an already choking stream and destroying its floodplains. For a city prone to debilitating floods, this was sound advice. Mangroves offer natural insurance against such disasters, absorbing any excess water in their network of root channels. But by 2001, the city had already destroyed over 40% of its mangroves, both along its Arabian Sea coast and along the Mithi River. The effects of this were felt in the floods of 2005, where three buildings collapsed, 32 people died, and the transportation system came to a standstill for a few days. What was to come yet was beyond anyone's imagination, however. For the city continued to choke its mangrove networks by dumping construction debris and garbage into the river, effectively plugging any drainage channels. By 2018, 70% of Bombay's mangroves were gone. And still the government was planning a coastal highway that would destroy more mangroves in the city and a bullet train connecting Bombay to the northern city of Ahmedabad, which would destroy swaths of mangroves just north of Bombay, where the Tharapur atomic reactor stood. The replanted mangrove forests never got the chance to protect the city. They needed time to acclimate and grow into their mature form, which would give them the strength to withstand the power of the ocean, the force of floods, which had only increased in the era of global warming and ice melts. The mangroves themselves could have helped alleviate some of this, for they are excellent carbon sinks, storing up to 40% more carbon than other forests. But this was an avenue that was already closed by 2020. Bombay's rising temperatures had not gone unnoticed by activists and environmentalists, which is why they were battling the government to stop the destruction of RA Forest. But the Bombay Municipal Corporation had its eyes set on developing this parcel of land, and nothing could sway them from their decision. Given that the Indian Forest Department did not then, and still does not to this day, have a working definition of what constitutes a forest, it was all too easy to disregard any objections. In the blink of an eye, Array went from being a forest, to being a disturbed forest, to not being a forest at all in the official narrative. What the government proposed instead was to transplant trees that were significantly old despite a meager survival rate for such transplantations. They started afforestation drives across the state, which were spectacular failures, for the saplings were planted without a plan for long-term care, and oftentimes without any care at all, as the many media stories of saplings planted with their root balls still covered in plastic will attest to. The success of these planting drives also depended on an increasingly erratic monsoon, which either never came, or when it did, it came with such a fury that it destroyed young saplings.
A third solution, which captured the imagination of the city, was the Miyawaki Forest, a Japanese technique for growing a stand of trees in a very short period of time by preparing acre plots of land with rich organic material. These stands would reach the height and density of a 12-year stand in a mere two years. By 2025, the city of Bombay had undertaken numerous such efforts, and Miyawaki forests proliferated across the city's landscape. But as you know, a forest is not just the trees. It is the relations that it holds that make the forest. And the Miyawaki forest was impoverished on that front. It was a great carbon sink while it lasted, but the root systems of these forests were not strong enough to withstand the storm that was to come. Having access to rich organic materials so close to the surface, they did not need to lay down deep roots. So when the flood and winds of 2027 came, these top-heavy forests toppled like a stack of cards. They say the great floods of 2042 were worse than expected. Though given the amount of time they though given the amount of time they had known about this impending catastrophe and the number of models that have been projected pretty much on an annual basis since 2027, that is hard to believe. That is when the flood projections started to take the shape of an industry after a spate of devastating floods over the period of a month in August that reduced every other flood the city had witnessed to merely heavy downpour. Mumbai girls were almost nostalgic for the floods of 2005 or the floods of 2017, but 2027 was a game changer. The death toll was in the thousands this time. The city was not getting any less crowded. Close to three million people had migrated to this urban mega cluster since 2017. Not only did structures collapse, but in fact many neighborhoods surrounding the floodplains of the Mithi River became seasonal islands, a sign of things to come. Transportation systems were not only incapacitated for almost a month, many of them were completely destroyed. Bombay's brand new metro system finally came face to face with an ugly truth that it had been refusing to accept. That its network of underground stations were not equipped to deal with the flow of this magnitude something its critics had been pointing out since the first plans were released. Phase 3 of the Metro had provided services to this city for merely six years before being reduced to an underwater archaeological site. The network of 338 pumping stations had been installed to make sure that the stations remained water-free Collapse for lack, lack of electricity. electricity. So did the Parapur Atomic Station, leaking nuclear waste into the Arabian Sea and turning the Bombay Basin into another Fukushima. We wonder what might have happened if the Save Area activists had succeeded in their efforts. We wonder what might have happened if the entire city of 20 million would have spoken up for us. Two zero two one zero nine. Nine. That, that was the that year was the when year the great, great floods, floods were predicted. predicted. We, we remember a map from back map 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 from back that showed the entire city of Bombay underwater by 2050, except zero. for the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. We, we were hopeful that we might survive that disaster. As a protected forest, we, we had hoped that we might be spared such indignities. But we, we should, should have known, known that we would eventually become a casualty as well. The year when change seemed almost possible 
because what was happening in the world was so impossible. How could you not recognize the signs? Forests in the Amazon, the Congo, and California were burning at an alarming rate, and bushfires had devastated large parts of Australia. That flaming summer, saved by the movement, made the connection with the larger climate issues and began working to frame their concerns within the larger context of climate chaos and climate collapse. After five years of a high visibility media campaign, the movement had garnered much public support. At least in the beginning, when the activists supported both the forest and the metro, this was changed towards the end of the movement, when activists questioned the very need for a new transportation infrastructure in the city, especially one that did not make sense from a climate chaos point of view. A vocal segment of this movement began to question the very wisdom of building a metro in Bombay rather than strengthening existing infrastructure. Turn the roads into dedicated bus lines, they said. This would alleviate traffic and also ensure fewer cars on the road. But these activists were branded as anti-development and as urban Marxists, casting the entire movement as anti-national. In the end, following a slew of lost court cases, the activists took to civil disobedience. They occupied the car shed in order to prevent the tree cutting, which only led to multiple arrests. The city even resurrected a British era law, Article 144, that criminalized public gatherings in the wake of this resistance. But for all the activism, in the end it was politics that eventually stopped the Metro caution. The Metro was a project of the ruling party at the time, the BJP. And when they lost in the midterm elections by a fluke, the opposition, the opposition came, came into power, power and was only too to happy, happy to put the brakes on, the their, brakes on their projects, projects, including the car shed, the, the coastal highway, highway, and the bullet train. train. But this victory was also short-lived. Three years down the line, the BJP was back in power, and all these projects were right back on the table. And this time, the government wanted more. First came the metro and then the biodiversity park. Why let the animals run free when they could be managed? The SRA project never took off the ground, for it became very clear that the vacated summer lands were not ideal in light of climate chaos. We were Bombay's last hope. Far away from the instability of the coast, the SGNP was the only land predicted to outlast the rising sea levels, and so began the next phase in our ongoing fragmentation. Instead of the poor, it was the rich who fled to our sheltering grounds. The SRA was replaced with a series of upscale housing projects that would that offer the who's who of Bombay a, a chance, chance to survive the climate chaos. By 2028, two zero two eight, one, one year after the annual flooding started with a ferocity unrivaled before, the plan, plan to relocate the rich had, had found significant, significant political backing. The slum dwellers would have to fight for themselves. They would they have, have to battle the melted, melted ice from the polar, polar caps, the nuclear waste pouring in from the atomic plant, and the swirling eddies of garbage that had been unmoored from, from the city's dump sites, which were now which all submerged, knocking at their doors with a fury. This was when the reverse migration began, and people, people began, began fleeing the city. But, but decades, decades of negligence of the country's rural heartland meant that they were jumping from the frying pan to the fire. To the fire. While, the coast, while the coast was being inundated with water, large parts of the country's interior were parched and bone dry. Further, 
in the aftermath of the collapse of India's vulture population in the north. Rotten cattle corpses have become a vector for anthrax. Dogs have taken over the niche left open by vultures, and, and their, their populations have increased tenfold by 2027. An increase in dog populations meant an increase in rabies, which had already been a public health issue in India for a long time. Stories about enormous packs of dogs wandering in the hundreds and roaming the countryside, attacking people, were urban legends in 2019. In 2027, they had become a reality. Those who preferred battling the toxic floods over packs of rabid dogs returned to the contaminated city, eking out an existence by providing services for the rich enclaves. Traveling back and forth from their seasonal islands, hoping sometimes for a flood to come and swallow the city whole. It did eventually come in 2042, but even this flood targeted mostly those on the amphibious margins, those within our perpetually fragmented forests are still safe. For how long, nobody knows. How do we know so much about the history of Bombay, you ask? We told you before, and we will tell you again. A forest is more than streets. You are also a part of us. We know this history, because you know this history. Never forget, you are forest too, and you are fragmenting with us. So what's the status of the RA forest today? Well, there has been a stay order on cutting trees at the metro site since December, but the indigenous Warli community and the activists say that tree cutting still goes on stealthily, especially now that there is less oversight during the pandemic-induced lockdown. Arson continues to be used as a way to clear areas of the forest. The state government is supposed to do an environmental impact assessment on the site, But the committee charged with doing this came back with an economic impact report instead a few months ago, saying it would be monetarily unfeasible to shift the metro car shed to a different site. So, the RA forest and the Warley community members' plights hang in limbo, while the citizens of Mumbai have taken to tree planting drives to offset the loss. In the meantime, the central government has just relaxed its environmental regulations across the country for infrastructure projects, raising the spectre of deforestation in the pristine forests of India's northeast, with significant impact on numerous tiger reserves. At least for the moment, the trails towards our future forests seem to be fragmenting even more. And that brings us to an end to tonight's special edition of Apex Express. Thank you for listening. Do join us for the post-show conversation on Zoom at tinyurl.com slash forests and floods with me and Anuj Baidya. For feedback and show ideas, please email us at apex at kpfa.org. Our theme music is by Asian Crisis. Tune back in next week for another edition of Apex Express. I've been your host and co-producer tonight, Priti Mahila Shekhar. Anuj Vaidya was both our special guest and co-producer with me. Thank you to Free Willing Franklin for his technical support. Stay safe and wear your masks everywhere.